Hello and welcome to today's webinar um, about data management in the revised national statement on ethical conduct in human research. Apologies for starting a few minutes late. Um, we've just had a few technical issues. Uh, so um, I'm Kate LeMay and I'm a Senior Research Data Specialist from the Australian Research Data Commons, which is an NCRIS facility that has been built from the Australian National Data Service, AMS, Nectar and RDS. For more information on on what the Australian Research Data Commons is doing now and into the future, please sign up for our newsletter. So I'm going to pass over to Jeremy Kenner, who's the expert advisor for ethics to the NHMRC's Research Quality and Priorities branch. Um, Jeremy, please take it away. Thank you, Kate, and welcome everybody. Um, what I'm gonna do here is to run you through um, so a very, very brief bit of background to how we got to the current uh, revision of the national statement and what's in it, and then drill down um, to the, the issues that are most pertinent for you all. Um, as some of you may be aware, the national statement is, um, is Australia's singular uh, principal guidance for conduct of ethical research and uh, ethical research and, and um, it is um, a particular type of document that is a bit different from some of the other documents of a similar type in other countries. One of the things that makes it difference, it, different is that it's not as detailed um, as some of those documents uh, and it applies to all human research but only to human research. Um, it's based on a, a principles-based approach to to research ethics, um, and um, it's been around since about, in one form or another, since about 1992. The current version was based on a full review uh, some years ago and published in 2007, and since then we have um, uh, reviewed it, uh, bits and pieces of it, small bits, bits and pieces of it, uh, from a single word to a paragraph to a, a full chapter, but we've never taken on a full one a full section before one of the five sections, which is what we did this time. So this national statement, you should have uh, now a slide that says national statement updated 2018. Um, this was uh, done over the last couple of years and published just last month um, with a fully revised uh, section three uh, with a new title, and it was, uh, as I say, released just last month. It, it made major strain changes to the structure and content, uh, as indicated based on an elements of research approach um, rather than a categories of research approach. And the, the guidance in it applies to all research and then um, becomes more specific as it goes along. And I'll explain that in the next series of slides. Um, chapter 3.1, which is the one that's relevant for this uh, webinar, is it relates to research in general and provides guidance related to specific types of research as necessary, incorporates some chapters that were previously separate. And one of the things that it adds is significantly greater guidance on ethical considerations related to collection, use, and management of data and information in research. There are a couple other specific chapters, one addressing genomic research, um, one addressing human biospecimens, and one addressing animal to human xenotransplantation. Now, if you, it also, there were changes made to one of the other sections that were a consequence of the changes made um, to section three, and those changes included the three uh, items as noted. Um, so this is just a, for your later use, just um, mapping out what the changes were to the document. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of implementation, uh, because of the, the significant the substantial nature of the changes, um, the current national statement, which was last updated in 2015, remains in effect during the transition period from now through December. Um, as I've said here, users of the national statement are expected to gradually integrate the new and revised guidance into the proposal submissions and review during the transition period, um, which will then end on the 1st of January, at which point the 2018 version will become formally um, the national statement. So there's a, a period of, I guess, some ambiguity where people might be asking which one should we apply, but we're hoping that common sense prevails on this point. So 
in section three, which I'm going to run through, um, not the, I'm not going to run through all of section three. Section three relates to the ethical considerations in the design, development, review, and conduct of research. Right. So there's an introduction to that section, which you will read in due course, I hope. Uh, and then there is an, an introduction to chapter 3.1, which is the elements of research. It then goes through each of those seven elements. If we move ahead, then um, you'll see guidelines and element one. And then what we're concerned with is element four. Now, the logic here is that when you use the national statement, you should be using it as a whole. So section three is read in the context of sections one and two having been previously understood and refers back to concepts in those sections as well as specific paragraphs. When you're using section three, um, everything is in the context of, of the section three um, sort of concept or philosophy. And then in chapter 3.1, you're referring, when you're using any of the elements, such as element four, you're, it is understood that you should have absorbed what is in the other elements as well. So you're not seeing anything in a, in a vacuum. Um, it's all contextualized. And that's important to understand with respect to how to use this, particularly when it comes to, um, for, for our purposes, issues related to the management of data and information that would be in, uh, in other chapters, which will then refer, refer back to this chapter's discussion of collection use and management of data information. Having said that, let's, let's, let's drill down now into some of the, the things that are uh, maybe somewhat new or maybe uh, differently worded um, versions of, of something that was already there. One of the main things to notice here is there is no specific chapter in the national statement now related to data banks, which there was. It was chapter 3.2. And a lot of the issues related to, to data were in that chapter. But of course, data banks is just a, a component of all of the issues. And so it was felt that the issues related to collection use and management of data information related to a much greater set of, of, uh, of expressions and, and all, all research, not just the ones that use data banks specifically. Now, what I've done here is I've highlighted a few, a few provisions in red. Um, I don't know if that's visible um, from the screen that you're using. I hope it is. But I'm just going to, instead of um, going through the whole thing, which is several, quite a number of pages, I'm going to highlight some 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 things that have been that, that that could be emphasized. The first is, of course, that that all of this information is um, contextualized by the ethical principles discussed in Section One of the National National Statement. And um, a second is that um, the purpose of the National Statement's uh, ethical guidelines is served by a positive attitude towards the use of population-wide data sets, um, and, um, that, and, the, and the idea that this promotes the core principle, ethical principle of justice, um, which has to do with the sharing, fair sharing of, of benefits and in, inclusion in, in research, participation in research. Some other, some other things that need to be understood in order to understand what we've done here. Um, anyone working in this field knows that the, the term data itself is a bit ambiguous. It means different things to different people. Uh, how it relates to the term information, there is no consensus view on that. However, we've attempted to, and, and I would credit ARDC here, formerly ANDS, with having a lot of input into this discussion. Um, we have decided to define these terms in a particular way for the purposes of this document, which may not be defensible more broadly applied. Um, and so we, we've, we've uh, uh, operating from the premise that data information are often used interchangeably, and then we define those terms for the purposes of this document. Um, again, this is in red for the purposes of the national statement data is intended to refer to, and then there's a bit of a, of a, of a, of a list there of things that, that, that are included. Um, and this, in, in understanding the rest of the statements, um, it needs to be understood that those, these are the definitions that we're using. Now, identifiability of information is a huge issue, maybe even 90% of the issue that, or whatever, that we are uh, addressing um, 
here. And we had a bit of a, a long debate about whether to use the terms that were in the national statement. The terms were personally identified, not uh, re-identifiable and non-identifiable versus the terms used in privacy legislation, which uh, were not the same. Generally, they are essentially identified and de-identified. Um, the national statement terms had been used in 2007 intentionally to not reflect the legislative terms, which were felt to be uh, inaccurate in the context of research or not as easily applied. So the debate um, ensued about whether which which set of terms to use the ones previously in the national statement or the ones that were that were in the privacy legislation and we eventually ended up with a decision which surprised all of us which was to use none of them and we wanted to discuss the issues related to identifiability without getting caught on um, specific labels and terms and so there's a footnote here that says what, what we've decided to do and essentially why. Um, and I hope that that's um, visible to, to you or that you can read it at another time. But we took the position that the identifiability of information was a characteristic that existed on a continuum, which was affected by a large number of, context, of, of contextual factors. And then we start discussing that. More, and importantly, we, we tried to, to point out that identifiability of information changes during the life cycle of a research project, and therefore, researchers and reviewers have to focus on the risk of harm that arises out of the, the identifiability of information issues um, at various stages of the research project, not just at the beginning, for example. And then we listed some factors that needed to be taken into consideration when determining the degree of identifiability of information and when evaluating the risks that are associated with them. Um, we then um, encourage people to go beyond the guidance related, included in the national statement to consult the Office of Information, Australian Information Commissioner um, and its state and territory equivalents, the Bureau of Statistics, the ANDS, now the ARDC, in addition to the national statement as there are, of course, very valuable resources available from those sources that, that can be used. Um, <clears throat> we, um, of course, consulted all of these entities in the development of this, uh, of this chapter. Um, now, we, we um, did talk about the methods that might be used to reduce the identifiability and consequent risks. Um, and um, uh, they're listed here. There are several of them. Uh, in relation to data management, um, we're pushing the idea of development of a data management plan for every research project. Now, this is not a requirement. You'll notice the use of the word should rather than must. So it's not something that can be imposed as a requirement of the national statement, but it's obviously strongly encouraged. Um, the word should and must are important in reading the national statement. Um, and I won't elaborate on that. I think it's sort of obvious um, what the difference is. Now, um, one of the things you might notice is that people tend to use different terms when they're talking about collection use management of information, and we've tried to use all of them. So we've got here saying data management plan should address intentions related to generation, collection, access, use, analysis, disclosure, storage, retention, disposal, sharing, and reuse of data and information. All of these are, in our view, related to the management of data. Um, and uh, um, the plan should be developed, importantly, as early as possible in the process. And um, then there are some, a list of eight um, things that were considered to be necessary to include in any data management plan. Now, all of these paragraphs, I would say, of course, are important to read. But I'm, we couldn't go through all of them, so I'm trying to highlight a few of them for you, for your consideration. Um, um, we have one here. It's number um, 3.1.50, although it's not listed that way on, your, uh, on the slide. Um, and it, it's the last one related to uh, data management. And this one um, um, is important for, for this discussion. Um, that in the absence of justifiable ethical reasons, and it lists them, um, um, and to promote access to the benefits of research, 
researchers should collect and store data information generated by research projects in such a way that they can be used in future research projects. Um, where a researcher believes there are valid reasons for not making this successful, it must be justified. So the default is that it should be available for future research, and, and if not, needs to be justified. Now, those justifications um, may be, uh, there may be many justifications that people can employ. So we didn't take an absolute position, but we obviously um, took a, a strong position on that. Um, <clears throat> with respect to secondary use of data information, which is a section of this chapter, I'm highlighting here the idea that it, um, um, there are other ways of demonstrating respect for individuals other than um, obtaining their consent. So if you can't obtain your consent, that isn't the end of the story. You need to then consider other ways of showing respect, amongst them community consultation, ensuring that the research results are translated into improvements in services and practices, acknowledging the source of the data or information in publications and or publishing research results in a location and language suitable for the general community. Um, data information, then we, then we try and wrestle with the, the whole problem of inter use of inter information obtained from the internet, um, which as we all know is very challenging. And we have quite a bit to say about this. Um, there's some highlighted language here that I won't read to you, but I'll emphasize that the guiding principle for researchers is that although the data or information may be publicly available, this does not automatically mean, automatically mean that the individuals with whom the data or information is associated have necessarily granted permission for its use. And therefore, we need to consider these, these things here. Um, um, however, we're still saying that consent is the gold standard, um, but if it's not available, then a waiver um, of, of requirement for consent may be obtainable. Um, uh, when we talk again about uh, social media platforms, researchers should take account of any terms and conditions applicable to these platforms when using data or information from these sources or platforms. Now, understanding, of course, that uh, most people don't read the small print. Nevertheless, um, if, if uh, there are requirements or conditions and terms in, about the use of those a particular social media platform, those need to be understood and adhered to in conducting research using that, that information. In terms of sharing of data or information, um, the, some requirements here, is em emphasis on the importance of identifying a custodian and the, the variety of people that, or entities that that could be, um, that the data management, management plan needs to be shared with that custodian so that they're aware of what is being promised to the participants um, or advised to them. Um, uh, it's important to distinguish in proposals to share or close research, disclose research data or information, the distinction between disclosure to specific third parties sharing with other researchers and disclosure to the public and to clarify which we're t you're talking about in consent documents. In thinking about all this, there are expectations that people will have, and this is independent even of, of the consent that's obtained, but it needs to be, um, be, under, be considered by researchers that there are expectations and policies regarding the sharing or reuse of information um, that um, uh, should consider the value of the data and uh, information for future research, um, and that these expectations should be clear to participants. Um, the last statement I've highlighted here is that shared or banked data or information that's stored in a form that can identify individuals can sometimes be used in research that qualifies as negligible or low-risk research. However, it cannot be used in research that ex is exempt from ethics review. Um, and that has to do with other clauses in the national statement at 5.1.22 and, uh, and 2.3, I believe. Um, so that's, that's the, the, um, some of the issues that I wanted to highlight from the, the new uh, text, the new content of Chapter 3.1 of Section 3 of the national statement. Um, there's some take-home messages that I've written down um, for your consideration. Um, the first is that we, 
We want, it should be clear that the national statement is not obstructive. It intends to support data linkage research, secondary use of data, and data sharing as long as it's in accordance with the basic principles of the national statement and the guidance provided in section three. That, if, that there's no one size fits all approach for um, that researchers can rely on. That would be artificial and uh, that it's all about context and proportionality. That is um, that um, care needs to be taken uh, in, to the extent possible, but also in proportion to the, the risks associated with what would happen if inappropriate care were taken. And um, that's, this is important for HRECs as well to consider, not to um, make overly restrictive requirements for research that, bear, that, that, that is accompanied by uh, minimal risk. That appropriate strategies to minimize the risk of unauthorized disclosure of identifying information need to be used. That planning ahead makes a lot of this a lot easier. If you develop and communicate data management plans after discussions amongst yourselves as researchers and then share those that information with, with uh, data custodians and HRACs, um, that is the importance of drafting contracts and other agreements um, with, uh, the, with any of the parties involved as, as early as possible, um, to ensure that the use of data is consistent with the expectations of those who provided it, the consent obtained, if any, and or any waiver granted, and to consult experts like ARDC as well as relevant review bodies. So I'll end it there, um, and if uh, uh, we have some questions, um, which I hope we will, I'm happy to address those. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, so there's a couple of questions that have come through in the question pod. The first one is, previously the term re-identifiable was used um, in the um, old statement um, where data was coded to researchers but they could still re-identify the patients. Um, the person is asking what term should be used in future to reflect, reflect a similar status of the way that data will be handled. Well, it's not so much that re-identifiable um, is, a, is a term that's verboten. It's that we, we wanted to, to, to emphasize the idea that identifiability was a bit of a movable feast and that re-identification was more, which should be best understood as a process that changes the character of the information rather than an absolute characteristic of the information itself. Um, information can be re-identifiable at one stage of the project but then let's call it non-identifiable at another stage of the project by virtue of it having been de-identified, which again is a process. We would argue that information isn't de-identified. A process of de-identification has been applied to it, making it difficult or impossible to, um, uh, to uh, identify. Um, and so we just didn't want to get trapped in the labels. The word, using the word re-identifiable, um, data is not a problem. Uh, it's just not something that we wanted to use in the national statement guidance. Obviously, if people understand what it means, but we, I would give you one example, and that is that um, there is a lot of argument in the genomics research community, for example, that there is no such thing as non-identifiable or fully de-identified or permanently de-identified information. That if people work hard enough and triangulate enough databases, they'll ultimately be able to re-identify information which everyone assumed was fully de-identified. And so that becomes problematic. Do you call it non-identifiable for all practical purposes? Do you call it re-identifiable because you're being purist in your understanding of what it is? Um, so we run into more problems. It, it sort of creates more problems than it solves. That's a long-winded answer to a simple question. <laughs> I apologize. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so another person has asked, is this retrospective for existing studies or prospective from December 2018? Prospective. Fabulous. Um, another person has asked, will the HREA be revised by January 2019 to re reflect the new 2018 national statement? It will. We're working on it now. It'll be ready by the time that, by, by January 1st, possibly earlier. Fabulous. Um, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, 
So another person has asked um, about um, section 55 to 54 um, in the section 3.1, is this guidance only relevant to internet data or information or all publicly available data? Okay, let me find what the reference is here. So this is um, in the, so this, this, for some reason, the way this printed out, it's supposed to say 3.1 point, but um, they, they, um, he's saying, is this, which, which, which paragraphs are we, is he asking about, or she? Uh, 51 to 54, I believe it's the part that was about the social okay. media and internet um, data on the internet. Yeah, I think the idea is that it should apply, let me just see what's directly before it. Um, that's interesting, I can't seem to go up. So, give me a second. There we go. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think it's it's meant to be limited to um, internet related data and we actually had a problem with, we even had a section originally on internet data, but we wanted to <clears throat> um, consider it more broadly. So I, 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 I'd have to, um, to look at it again, but my instinctive response is that it's intended to apply to all secondary use of data information, not just that obtained from the internet. If we don't say in the paragraph with respect to data obtained from the internet, then we, we mean it more broadly. Excellent. But there are there are some questions we've been sorry, there are some questions we've been asked about what constitutes publicly available data. Um, for example, um, pub, if you've got if you've got information that's in a newspaper article, um, that wasn't collected um, in the same way as we consider data collected. But if you want to use uh, information from a newspaper article or a book published in 1856, um, do you consider that publicly available data or not? And so we, we there are there is a, a little bit of ambiguity here. And again, um, we're hoping that mostly people are using a common sense approach. Excellent. Jeremy, I'll just ask you one more uh, quick question. There's a couple more that have come in, but we'll address them um, afterwards in a question and answer document that will be made available to everyone. Um, this last question here is, the option for granting a waiver for consent currently exists and leads to different and inconsistent decisions by ethics committees. Will the revised guidelines help to reduce this inconsistency? Well, inconsistency of application, unfortunately, isn't really within the scope of the NHMRC's authority to resolve. Um, the fact that things are, uh, that provisions of the national statement are applied inconsistently can have to do with, um, you know, poorly written um, provisions, or it can have to do with different um, philosophies and uh, attitudes that, that, that reviewing bodies have. Um, we can't arbit arbitrate that and say this one's right and this one's wrong. We're not um, authorized to do that. Um, all we can do is reiterate our interpretation of our own documents, which we often do in the form of responses to queries that people give us. I'd have to know more about the nature of the inconsistency in order to comment more intelligently on that question. Okay, thank you so much, Jeremy, happy, for your time happy today. To, you're happy to write in and ask. Um, and the, uh, the last slide here is uh, some contact information. So um, again, you're, you're welcome, we'll, we'll respond. Excellent. Uh, so thank you very much, Jeremy, for your time today. And I'd just like to remind all of the um, people who have um, joined our webinar that um, ARDC uh, has a lot of resources around um, data management and um, some of the topics that Jeremy touched on, such as de-identification and data management plans. Um, our resources will be updated to include the new requirements from the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research. Currently, they are all still sitting on the ANDS website. So if you go to ANDS, that's ands.org.au forward slash medical, that's a great page to start on to um, find all of the resources that are related to um, these topics that Jeremy has been touching on today. So thank you, Jeremy, for um, speaking to us. Thank you, everyone.